Chapter One of War is a Racket by Smedley Butler, Major General, retired U.S. Marine Corps. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. War is a Racket by Smedley Butler, Major General, retired. Chapter One. Contents. Chapter One. War is a Racket. Chapter Two. Who makes the profits? Chapter Three. Who pays the bills? Chapter Four. How to smash this racket. Chapter Five. To hell with war. Smedley Darlington Butler, born Westchester, Pennsylvania, July thirtieth, eighteen eighty one. Educated Haverford School. Married Ethel C. Peters of Philadelphia, June thirtieth, nineteen o five. Awarded two Congressional Medals of Honor, one Capture of Veracruz, Mexico, nineteen fourteen, two Capture of Fort Riviere, Haiti, nineteen seventeen. Distinguished Service Medal, nineteen nineteen. Major General, United States Marine Corps. Retired October first, nineteen thirty one. On leave of absence to act as Director of Department of Safety, Philadelphia, nineteen thirty two. Lecturer, nineteen thirties. Republican candidate for Senate, nineteen thirty two. Died at Naval Hospital, Philadelphia, June twenty first, nineteen forty. For more information about Major General Butler, contact the United States Marine Corps. Chapter One War is a Racket. War is a racket. It always has been. It is possibly the oldest, easily the most profitable, surely the most vicious. It is the only one international in scope. It is the only one in which the profits are reckoned in dollars and the losses in lives. A racket is best described, I believe, as something that is not what it seems to the majority of the people. Only a small inside group knows what it is about. It is conducted for the benefit of the very few, at the expense of the very many. Out of war a few people make huge fortunes. In the World War I a mere handful garnered the profits of the conflict. At least twenty-one thousand new millionaires and billionaires were made in the United States during the World War. That many admitted their huge blood gains in their income tax returns. How many other war millionaires falsified their tax returns, no one knows. How many of these war millionaires shouldered a rifle? How many of them dug a trench? How many of them knew what it meant to go hungry in a rat-infested dugout? How many of them spent sleepless, frightened nights ducking shells and shrapnel and machine-gun bullets? How many of them parried a bayonet thrust of an enemy? How many of them were wounded or killed in battle? Out of war nations acquire additional territory, if they are victorious. They just take it. This newly acquired territory promptly is exploited by the few, the self-same few who wrung dollars out of blood in the war. The general public shoulders the bill. And what is this bill? This bill renders a horrible accounting. Newly placed gravestones, mangled bodies, shattered minds, broken hearts and homes, economic instability, depression, and all its attendant miseries, backbreaking taxation for generations and generations. For a great many years as a soldier, I had a suspicion that war was a racket. Not until I retired to civil life did I fully realize it. Now that I see the international war clouds gathering as they are today, I must face it and speak out. Again they are choosing sides. France and Russia met and agreed to stand side by side. Italy and Austria hurried to make a similar agreement. Poland and Germany cast sheep-eyes at each other 
forgetting for the nonce one unique occasion their dispute over the polish corridor the assassination of king alexander of jugoslavia yugoslavia complicated matters jugoslavia and hungary long bitter enemies were almost at each other's throats italy was ready to jump in but france was waiting so was czechoslovakia all of them are looking ahead to war not the people not those who fight and pay and die only those who foment wars and remain safely at home to profit there are forty million men under arms in the world today and our statesmen and diplomats have the temerity to say that war is not in the making hell's bells are these forty million men being trained to be dancers not in italy to be sure premier mussolini knows what they are being trained for he at least is frank enough to speak out only the other day il duce in international conciliation the publication of the carnegie endowment for international peace said and above all fascism the more it considers and observes the future and the development of humanity quite apart from political considerations of the moment believes neither in the possibility nor the utility of perpetual peace war alone brings up to its highest tension all human energy and puts the stamp of nobility upon the people who have the courage to meet it undoubtedly mussolini means exactly what he says his well-trained army his great fleet of planes and even his navy are ready for war anxious for it apparently his recent stand at the side of hungary in the latter's dispute with jugoslavia showed that and the hurried mobilization of his troops on the austrian border after the assassination of dolphus showed it too there are others in europe too whose saber-rattling presages war sooner or later herr hitler with his rearming germany and his constant demands for more and more arms is an equal if not greater menace to peace france only recently increased the term of military service for its youth from a year to eighteen months yes all over nations are camping in their arms the mad dogs of europe are on the loose in the orient the maneuvering is more adroit back in nineteen o four when russia and japan fought we kicked out our old friends the russians and backed japan then our very generous international bankers were financing japan now the trend is to poison us against the japanese what does the open door policy to china mean to us our trade with china is about ninety million dollars a year or the philippine islands we have spent about six hundred million dollars in the philippines in thirty-five years and we our bankers and industrialists and speculators have private investments there of less than two hundred million dollars then to save that china trade of about ninety million dollars or to protect these private investments of less than two hundred million dollars in the philippines we would be all stirred up to hate japan and go to war a war that might well cost us tens of billions of dollars hundreds of thousands of lives of americans and many more hundreds of thousands of physically maimed and mentally unbalanced men of course for this loss there would be a compensating profit fortunes would be made millions and billions of dollars would be piled up by a few munitions makers bankers 
shipbuilders, manufacturers, meat packers, speculators. They would fare well. Yes, they are getting ready for another war. Why shouldn't they? It pays high dividends. But what does it profit the men who are killed? What does it profit their mothers and sisters, their wives and their sweethearts? What does it profit their children? What does it profit anyone except the very few to whom war means huge profits? Yes, and what does it profit the nation? Take our own case. Until 1898, we didn't own a bit of territory outside the mainland of North America. At that time, our national debt was a little more than one billion dollars. Then we became internationally minded. We forgot, or shunted aside, the advice of the father of our country. We forgot George Washington's warning about entangling alliances. We went to war. We acquired outside territory. At the end of the World War period, as a direct result of our fiddling in international affairs, our national debt had jumped to over twenty-five billion dollars. Our total favorable trade balance during the twenty-five-year period was about twenty-four billion dollars. Therefore, on a purely bookkeeping basis, we ran a little behind year for year, and that foreign trade might well have been ours without the wars. It would have been far cheaper, not to say safer, for the average American who pays the bills to stay out of foreign entanglements. For a very few, this racket, like bootlegging and other underworld rackets, brings fancy profits, but the cost of operations is always transferred to the people who do not profit. End of chapter one, War is a Racket, read by John Greenman. Chapter two of War is a Racket by Smedley Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. War is a Racket, Chapter Two. Who Makes the Profits? The World War, rather our brief participation in it, has cost the United States some fifty-two billion dollars. Figure it out. That means four hundred dollars to every American man, woman, and child, and we haven't paid the debt yet. We are paying it, our children will pay it, and our children's children probably still will be paying the cost of that war. The normal profits of a business concern in the United States are six, eight, ten, and sometimes twelve per cent. But wartime profits, ah, that is another matter. Twenty, sixty, one hundred, three hundred, and even eighteen hundred per cent. The sky is the limit. All that traffic will bear. Uncle Sam has the money. Let's get it. Of course, it isn't put that crudely in wartime. It is dressed into speeches about patriotism, love of country, and we must all put our shoulders to the wheel. But the prophets jump and leap and skyrocket, and are all safely pocketed. Let's just take a few examples. Take our friends, the DuPonts, the powder people. Didn't one of them testify before the Senate committee recently that their powder won the war, or saved the world for democracy or something? How did they do in the war? They were a patriotic corporation. Well, the average earnings of the DuPonts for the period 1910 to 1914 were six million dollars a year. It wasn't much, 
but the duponts managed to get along on it now let's look at their average yearly profit during the war years nineteen fourteen to nineteen eighteen fifty eight million dollars a year profit we find nearly ten times that of normal times and the profits of normal times were pretty good an increase in profits of more than nine hundred and fifty per cent take one of our little steel companies that patriotically shunted aside the making of rails and girders and bridges to manufacture war materials well their nineteen ten to nineteen fourteen yearly earnings averaged six million dollars then came the war and like loyal citizens bethlehem steel promptly turned to munitions making did their profits jump or did they let uncle sam in for a bargain well their nineteen fourteen to nineteen eighteen average was forty nine million dollars a year or let's take united states steel the normal earnings during the five-year period prior to the war were one hundred and five million dollars a year not bad then along came the war and up went the profits the average yearly profit for the period nineteen fourteen to nineteen eighteen was two hundred and forty million dollars not bad there you have some of the steel and powder earnings let's look at something else a little copper perhaps that always does well in war times anaconda for instance average yearly earnings during the pre-war years nineteen ten to nineteen fourteen of ten million dollars during the war years nineteen fourteen to nineteen eighteen profits leapt to thirty four million dollars per year or utah copper average of five million dollars per year during the nineteen ten to nineteen fourteen period jumped to an average of twenty one million dollars yearly profits for the war period let's group these five with three smaller companies the total yearly average profits of the pre-war period nineteen ten to nineteen fourteen were a hundred and thirty seven thousand four hundred and eighty dollars then along came the war the average yearly profits for this group skyrocketed to four hundred and eight million three hundred thousand dollars a little increase in profits of approximately two hundred per cent does war pay it paid them but they aren't the only ones there are still others let's take leather for the three-year period before the war the total profits of central leather company were three million five hundred thousand dollars that was approximately one million one hundred and sixty seven thousand dollars a year well in nineteen sixteen central leather returned a profit of fifteen million dollars a small increase of one thousand one hundred per cent that's all the general chemical company averaged a profit for the three years before the war of a little over eight hundred thousand dollars a year came the war and the profits jumped to twelve million dollars a leap of one thousand four hundred per cent international nickel company and you can't have a war without nickel showed an increase in profits from a mere average of four million dollars a year to seventy three million dollars yearly not bad an increase of more than one thousand seven hundred per cent american sugar refining company averaged two million dollars a year for the three years before the war in nineteen sixteen a profit of six million dollars was recorded listen to senate document number two hundred and fifty nine the sixty fifth congress reporting on corporate earnings and government revenues considering the profits of a hundred and twenty two meat packers one hundred and fifty three cotton manufacturers two hundred and ninety nine 
garment makers forty-nine steel plants and three hundred and forty coal producers during the war profits under twenty-five per cent were exceptional for instance the coal companies made between one hundred per cent and seven thousand eight hundred and fifty six per cent on their capital stock during the war the chicago packers doubled and tripled their earnings and let us not forget the bankers who financed the great war if any one had the cream of the profits it was the bankers being partnerships rather than incorporated organizations they do not have to report to stockholders and their profits were as secret as they were immense how the bankers made their millions and their billions i do not know because those little secrets never become public even before a senate investigatory body but here's how some of the other patriotic industrialists and speculators chiseled their way into war profits take the shoe people they like war it brings business with abnormal profits they made huge profits on sales abroad to our allies perhaps like the munitions manufacturers and armament makers they also sold to the enemy for a dollar is a dollar whether it comes from germany or from france but they did well by uncle sam too for instance they sold uncle sam thirty-five million pairs of hobnailed service shoes there were four million soldiers eight pairs and more to a soldier my regiment during the war had only one pair to a soldier some of these shoes probably are still in existence they were good shoes but when the war was over uncle sam has a matter of twenty-five million pairs left over bought and paid for profits recorded and pocketed there was still lots of leather left so the leather people sold your uncle sam hundreds of thousands of mcclellan saddles for the cavalry but there wasn't any american cavalry overseas somebody had to get rid of this leather however somebody had to make a profit in it so we had a lot of mcclellan saddles and we probably have those yet also somebody had a lot of mosquito netting they sold your uncle sam twenty million mosquito nets for the use of the soldiers overseas i suppose the boys were expected to put it over them as they tried to sleep in muddy trenches one hand scratching cooties on their backs and the other making passes at scurrying rats well not one of these mosquito nets ever got to france anyhow these thoughtful manufacturers wanted to make sure that no soldier would be without his mosquito net so forty million additional yards of mosquito netting were sold to uncle sam there were pretty good profits in mosquito netting in those days even if there were no mosquitoes in france i suppose if the war had lasted just a little longer the enterprising mosquito netting manufacturers would have sold your uncle sam a couple of consignments of mosquitoes to plant in france so that more mosquito netting would be in order airplane and engine manufacturers felt they too should get their just profits out of this war why not everybody else was getting theirs so one billion dollars count them if you lived long enough was spent by uncle sam in building airplane engines that never left the ground not one plane or motor out of the billion dollars worth ordered ever got into a battle in france just the same the manufacturers made their little profit of thirty one hundred or perhaps three hundred per cent 
undershirts for soldiers cost fourteen cents to make and uncle sam paid thirty cents to forty cents each for them a nice little profit for the undershirt manufacturer and the stocking manufacturer and the uniform manufacturers and the cap manufacturers and the steel helmet manufacturers all got theirs why when the war was over some four million sets of equipment knapsacks and the things that go to fill them crammed warehouses on this side now they are being scrapped because the regulations have changed the contents but the manufacturers collected their wartime profits on them and they will do it all over again the next time there were lots of brilliant ideas for profit-making during the war one very versatile patriot sold uncle sam twelve dozen forty-eight inch wrenches oh they were very nice wrenches the only trouble was that there was only one nut ever made that was large enough for these wrenches that is the one that holds the turbans at niagara falls well after uncle sam had bought them and the manufacturer had pocketed the profit the wrenches were put on freight cars and shunted all around the united states in an effort to find a use for them when the armistice was signed it was indeed a sad blow to the wrench manufacturer he was just about to make some nuts to fit the wrenches then he planned to sell these too to your uncle sam still another had the brilliant idea that colonels shouldn't ride in automobiles nor should they even ride on horseback one has probably seen a picture of andy jackson riding in a buckboard well some six thousand buckboards were sold to uncle sam for the use of colonels not one of them was used but the buckboard manufacturer got his war profit the shipbuilders felt they should come in on some of it too they built a lot of ships that made a lot of profit more than three billion dollars worth some of the ships were all right but six hundred and thirty five million dollars worth of them were made of wood and wouldn't float the seams opened up and they sank we paid for them though and somebody pocketed the profits it has been estimated by statisticians and economists and researchers that the war cost your uncle sam fifty two billion dollars of this sum thirty nine billion dollars was expended in the actual war itself this expenditure yielded sixteen billion dollars in profits that is how the twenty one thousand billionaires and millionaires got that way this sixteen billion dollars profits is not to be sneezed at it is quite a tidy sum and it went to a very few the senate nye committee probe of the munitions industry and its wartime profits despite its sensational disclosures hardly has scratched the surface even so it has had some effect the state department has been studying for some time methods of keeping out of war the war department suddenly decides it has a wonderful plan to spring the administration names a committee with the war and navy departments ably represented under the chairmanship of a wall street speculator to limit profits in wartime to what extent isn't suggested hmm possibly the profits of three hundred and six hundred and sixteen hundred per cent of those who turned blood into gold in the world war would be limited to some smaller figure apparently however the plan does not call for any limitation of losses that is 
the losses of those who fight the war as far as i have been able to ascertain there is nothing in the scheme to limit a soldier to the loss of but one eye or one arm or to limit his wounds to one or two or three or to limit the loss of life there is nothing in this scheme apparently that says not more than twelve per cent of a regiment shall be wounded in battle or that not more than seven per cent in a division shall be killed of course the committee cannot be bothered with such trifling matters end of chapter two who makes the profits read by john greenman chapter three of war is a racket this librivox recording is in the public domain war is a racket by smedley butler chapter three who pays the bills who provides the profits these nice little profits of twenty one hundred three hundred fifteen hundred and eighteen hundred per cent we all pay them in taxation we paid the bankers their profits when we bought liberty bonds at one hundred dollars and sold them back at eighty four dollars or eighty six dollars to the bankers these bankers collected one hundred dollars plus it was a simple manipulation the bankers control the security marts it was easy for them to depress the price of these bonds then all of us the people got frightened and sold the bonds at eighty four dollars or eighty six dollars the bankers bought them then these same bankers stimulated a boom and government bonds went to par and above then the bankers collected their profits but the soldier pays the biggest part of the bill if you don't believe this visit the american cemeteries on the battlefields abroad or visit any of the veterans hospitals in the united states on a tour of the country in the midst of which i am at the time of this writing i have visited eighteen government hospitals for veterans in them are a total of about fifty thousand destroyed men men who were the pick of the nation eighteen years ago the very able chief surgeon at the government hospital at milwaukee where there are three thousand eight hundred of the living dead told me that mortality among veterans is three times as great as among those who stayed at home boys with a normal viewpoint were taken out of the fields and offices and factories and classrooms and put into the ranks there they were remolded they were made over they were made to about face to regard murder as the order of the day they were put shoulder to shoulder and through mass psychology they were entirely changed we used them for a couple of years and trained them to think nothing at all of killing or of being killed then suddenly we discharged them and told them to make another about face this time they had to do their own readjustment sans without mass psychology sans officers aid and advice and sans nationwide propaganda we didn't need them any more so we scattered them about without any three-minute or liberty loan speeches or parades many too many of these fine young boys are eventually destroyed mentally because they could not make that final about face alone in the government hospital in marion indiana one thousand eight hundred of these boys are in pens five hundred of them in a barracks with steel bars and wires all around outside the buildings 
and on the porches. These already have been mentally destroyed. These boys don't even look like human beings. Oh, the looks on their faces! Physically, they are in good shape. Mentally, they are gone. There are thousands and thousands of these cases, and more and more are coming in all the time. The tremendous excitement of the war, the sudden cutting off of that excitement, the young boys couldn't stand it. That's a part of the bill. So much for the dead. They have paid their part of the war profits. So much for the mentally and physically wounded. They are paying now their share of the war profits. But the others paid too. They paid with heartbreaks when they tore themselves away from their firesides and their families to don the uniform of Uncle Sam, on which a profit had been made. They paid another part in the training camps where they were regimented and drilled while others took their jobs and their places in the lives of their communities. They paid for it in the trenches where they shot and were shot, where they were hungry for days at a time, where they slept in the mud and the cold and in the rain with the moans and shrieks of the dying for a horrible lullaby. But don't forget, the soldier paid part of the dollars and cents bill, too. Up to and including the Spanish-American War, we had a prize system, and soldiers and sailors fought for money. During the Civil War, they were paid bonuses, in many instances, before they went into service. The government or states paid as high as twelve hundred dollars for an enlistment. In the Spanish-American War they gave prize money. When we captured any vessels the soldiers all got their share. At least they were supposed to. Then it was found that we could reduce the cost of wars by taking all the prize money and keeping it. But conscripting drafting the soldier anyway. Then soldiers couldn't bargain for their labor. Everyone else could bargain, but the soldier couldn't. Napoleon once said, All men are enamored of decorations. They positively hunger for them. So by developing the Napoleonic system, the metal business, the government learned it could get soldiers for less money, because the boys liked to be decorated. Until the Civil War there were no medals. Then the Congressional Medal of Honor was handed out. It made enlistments easier. After the Civil War no new medals were issued until the Spanish-American War. In the World War we used propaganda to make the boys accept conscription. They were made to feel ashamed if they didn't join the army. So vicious was this war propaganda that even God was brought into it. With few exceptions our clergymen joined in the clamor to kill, kill, kill. To kill the Germans. God is on our side. It is his will that the Germans be killed. And in Germany, the good pastors called upon the Germans to kill the Allies, to please the same God. That was a part of the general propaganda, built up to make people war-conscious and murder-conscious. Beautiful ideals were painted for our boys who were sent out to die. This was the war to end all wars. This was the war to make the world safe for democracy. No one mentioned to them, as they marched away, that their going and their dying would mean huge war profits. No one told these American soldiers that they might be shot down by bullets made by their own brothers here. No one told them 
that the ships on which they were going to cross might be torpedoed by submarines built with united states patents they were just told it was to be a glorious adventure thus having stuffed patriotism down their throats it was decided to make them help pay for the war too so we gave them the large salary of thirty dollars a month all they had to do for this munificent sum was to leave their dear ones behind give up their jobs lie in swampy trenches eat canned willy when they could get it and kill and kill and kill and be killed but wait half of that wage just a little more than a riveter in a shipyard or a laborer in a munitions factory safe at home made in a day was promptly taken from him to support his dependents so that they would not become a charge upon his community then we made him pay what amounted to accident insurance something the employer pays for in an enlightened state and that cost him six dollars a month he had less than nine dollars a month left then the most crowning insolence of all he was virtually blackjacked into paying for his own ammunition clothing and food by being made to buy liberty bonds most soldiers got no money at all on paydays we made them buy liberty bonds at one hundred dollars then we bought them back when they came back from the war and couldn't find work at eighty four dollars and eighty six dollars and the soldiers bought about two billion dollars worth of these bonds yes the soldier pays the greater part of the bill his family pays too they pay it in the same heartbreak that he does as he suffers they suffer at nights as he lay in the trenches and watched shrapnel burst about him they lay home in their beds and tossed sleeplessly his father his mother his wife his sisters his brothers his sons and his daughters when he returned home minus an eye or minus a leg or with his mind broken they suffered too as much as and even sometimes more than he yes and they too contributed their dollars to the profits of the munitions makers and bankers and shipbuilders and the manufacturers and the speculators made they too bought liberty bonds and contributed to the profit of the bankers after the armistice in the hocus-pocus of manipulated liberty bond prices and even now the families of the wounded men and of the mentally broken and those who never were able to readjust themselves are still suffering and still paying end of chapter three who pays the bills read by john greenman chapter four of war is a racket this librivox recording is in the public domain war is a racket by smedley butler chapter four how to smash this racket well it is a racket all right a few profit and the many pay but there is a way to stop it you can't end it by disarmament conferences you can't eliminate it by peace parleys at geneva well-meaning but impractical groups can't wipe it out by resolutions it can be smashed effectively only by taking the profit out of war the only way to smash this racket is to conscript capital and industry and labor before the nation's manhood can be conscripted one month before the government can conscript the young man of the nation 
it must conscript capital and industry and labor let the officers and the directors and the high-powered executives of our armament factories and our munitions makers and our ship builders and our airplane builders and the manufacturers of all the other things that provide profit in wartime as well as the bankers and the speculators be conscripted to get thirty dollars a month the same wage as the lads in the trenches get let the workers in these plants get the same wages all the workers all presidents all executives all directors all managers all bankers yes and all generals and all admirals and all officers and all politicians and all government office holders everyone in the nation be restricted to a total monthly income not to exceed that paid to the soldier in the trenches let all these kings and tycoons and masters of business and all those workers in industry and all our senators and governors and majors pay half of their monthly thirty dollar wage to their families and pay war risk insurance and buy liberty bonds why shouldn't they they aren't running any risk of being killed or of having their bodies mangled or their minds shattered they aren't sleeping in muddy trenches they aren't hungry the soldiers are give capital and industry and labor thirty days to think it over and you will find by that time there will be no war that will smash the war racket that and nothing else maybe i am a little too optimistic capital still has some say so capital won't permit the taking of the profit out of war until the people those who do the suffering and still pay the price make up their minds that those they elect to office shall do their bidding and not that of the profiteers another step necessary in this fight to smash the war racket is the limited plebiscite to determine whether a war should be declared a plebiscite not of all the voters but merely of those who would be called upon to do the fighting and dying there wouldn't be very much sense in having a seventy-six-year-old president of a munitions factory or the flat-footed head of an international banking firm or the cross-eyed manager of a uniform manufacturing plant all of whom see visions of tremendous profits in the event of war voting on whether the nation should go to war or not they never would be called upon to shoulder arms to sleep in a trench and to be shot only those who would be called upon to risk their lives for their country should have the privilege of voting to determine whether the nation should go to war there is ample precedent for restricting the voting to those affected many of our states have restrictions on those permitted to vote in most it is necessary to be able to read and write before you may vote in some you must own property it would be a simple matter each year for the men coming of military age to register in their communities as they did in the draft during the world war and be examined physically those who could pass and who would therefore be called upon to bear arms in the event of war would be eligible to vote in a limited plebiscite they should be the ones to have the power to decide and not a congress few of whose members are within the age limit and fewer still of whom are in physical condition to bear arms only those who must suffer should have the right to vote 
a third step in this business of smashing the war racket is to make certain that our military forces are truly forces for defense only at each session of congress the question of further naval appropriations comes up the swivel chair admirals of washington and there are always a lot of them are very adroit lobbyists and they are smart they don't shout that we need a lot of battleships to war on this nation or that nation oh no first of all they let it be known that america is menaced by a great naval power almost any day these admirals will tell you the great fleet of this supposed enemy will strike suddenly and annihilate one hundred and twenty-five million people just like that then they begin to cry for a larger navy for what to fight the enemy oh my no oh no for defense purposes only then incidentally they announce maneuvers in the pacific for defense uh -huh. the pacific is a great big ocean we have a tremendous coastline on the pacific will the maneuvers be off the coast two or three hundred miles oh no the maneuvers will be two thousand yes perhaps even thirty-five hundred miles off the coast the japanese a proud people of course will be pleased beyond expression to see the united states fleet so close to nippon's shores even as pleased as would be the residents of california were they to dimly discern through the morning mist the japanese fleet playing at war games off los angeles the ships of our navy it can be seen should be specifically limited by law to within two hundred miles of our coastline had that been the law in eighteen ninety eight the maine would never have gone to havana harbor she never would have been blown up there would have been no war with spain with its attendant loss of life two hundred miles is ample in the opinion of experts for defense purposes our nation cannot start an offensive war if its ships can't go further than two hundred miles from the coastline planes might be permitted to go as far as five hundred miles from the coast for purposes of reconnaissance and the army should never leave the territorial limits of our nation to summarize three steps must be taken to smash the war racket one we must take the profit out of war two we must permit the youth of the land who would bear arms to decide whether or not there should be war three we must limit our military forces to home defense purposes end of chapter four how to smash this racket read by john greenman Chapter Five of War Is a Racket. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. War Is a Racket by Smedley Butler. Chapter Five. To Hell with War. I am not a fool, as to believe that war is a thing of the past. I know the people do not want war, but there is no use in saying we cannot be pushed into another war. Looking back woodrow wilson was re-elected president in nineteen sixteen on a platform that he had kept us out of war and on the implied promise that he would keep us out of war yet five months later he asked congress to declare war on germany in that five-month interval the people had not been asked whether they had changed their minds the four million young men who put on uniforms and marched or sailed away were not asked whether they wanted to go forth to suffer and die then what caused our government to change its mind so suddenly money 
an allied commission it may be recalled came over shortly before the war declaration and called on the president the president summoned a group of advisers the head of the commission spoke stripped of its diplomatic language this is what he told the president and his group there is no use kidding ourselves any longer the cause of the allies is lost we now owe you american bankers american munitions makers american manufacturers american speculators american exporters five or six billion dollars if we lose and without the help of the united states we must lose we england france and italy cannot pay back this money and germany won't so had secrecy been outlawed as far as war negotiations were concerned and had the press been invited to be present at that conference or had radio been available to broadcast the proceedings america never would have entered the world war but this conference like all war discussions was shrouded in utmost secrecy when our boys were sent off to war they were told it was a war to make the world safe for democracy and a war to end all wars well eighteen years after the world has less of democracy than it had then besides what business is it of ours whether russia or germany or england or france or italy or austria live under democracies or monarchies whether they are fascists or communists our problem is to preserve our own democracy and very little if anything has been accomplished to assure us that the world war was really the war to end all wars yes we have had disarmament conferences and limitations of arms conferences they don't mean a thing one has just failed the results of another have been nullified we send our professional soldiers and our sailors and our politicians and our diplomats to these conferences and what happens the professional soldiers and sailors don't want to disarm no admiral wants to be without a ship no general wants to be without a command both mean men without jobs they are not for disarmament they cannot be for limitations of arms and at all these conferences lurking in the background but all powerful just the same are the sinister agents of those who profit by war they see to it that these conferences do not disarm or seriously limit armaments the chief aim of any power at any of these conferences has not been to achieve disarmament to prevent war but rather to get more armament for itself and less for any potential foe there is only one way to disarm with any semblance of practicability that is for all nations to get together and scrap every ship every gun every rifle every tank every warplane even this if it were possible would not be enough the next war according to experts will be fought not with battleships not by artillery not with rifles and not with machine guns it will be fought with deadly chemicals and gases secretly each nation is studying and perfecting newer and ghastlier means of annihilating its foes wholesale yes ships will continue to be built for the shipbuilders must make their profits and guns still will be manufactured and powder and rifles will be made for the munitions makers must make their huge profits and the soldiers of course must wear uniforms for the manufacturer must make their war profits too but victory or defeat will be determined by the skill and ingenuity of our scientists if we put them to work making poison gas and more and more fiendish mechanical and explosive instruments of destruction they will have no time for the constructive job of building greater prosperity for all peoples 
by putting them to this useful job we can all make more money out of peace than we can out of war even the munitions makers so i say to hell with war end of chapter five to hell with war and end of war is a racket by major general smedley butler read by john greenman